Hello, everyone. Welcome to Writing Excuses Q&A. My name is Mary Robinette Kowal. My name's Howard Taylor. <laughs> this is the part of the show that you'd call a cold open, only it's like extra cold because we didn't practice it. I have no idea yeah, how any this of this is, goes. This is, uh, this is where you get to see what we jokingly call the video feed when you're listening to our podcast. Um, and the reason we don't have a video feed is because there's a lot of, uh, you know, the, a, a lot of making of that happens before, uh, before we actually start recording. Um, and now you get to join us on that. In this Q and A, what's going to happen is we have questions that our Patreon subscribers and supporters have given us. We're going to answer those questions and, uh, and then hopefully we will provide some answers that are useful. So having said that, let's start with our first question. Um, so this question is, uh, if a writer has used their real name as a brand for a different career field, would it be better to A, work on rebranding name for writing author purposes, or B, just use a pen name? And, um, I have I have feelings about this, but I'm gonna let Howard. I'm gonna let you go first. Um, sure. I'm busy copying a link and pasting it to Twitter, so that maybe someone will watch us. Um, all right, then uh, I will go first. Uh, you you don't need a pen name at all. Um, there's no yeah. reason that you cannot have those two careers happening simultaneously. I use the same name for my puppetry, for my narration, and for my writing. I use the same name for my adult stuff and for my kids' stuff. The only time you need a different name is if you have a completely different brand. So if, for instance, I were writing erotic adult work and picture books, I would want two different names to make those two different brands because they uh, they serve two wildly different audiences that should not intersect. Yeah, when your brands when your brands exist in potential conflict, then yeah, you you'd want you'd want to find a way to keep them separate. Uh, our friend Gail Carriger. Um, did that for years because in one life she was she ha she has a career which involves people who don't want to know that a co-worker is writing sci-fi fantasy whatevers um yeah i remember um uh david farland dave wolverton uh our friend um who who has since passed who was I believe a fantasy writer first and then going into sci-fi publisher told him um yeah we need another name for you because your brand is fantasy and uh and that name won't work and at the time that might have been like the trailing edge of the right answer but I don't think it did Dave Wolverton's career any favors no. Yeah. I write science fiction and fantasy and I use the same name for both. Uh, Sean and McGuire and Mary Grant uh, use two, you know, Sean and has two different personas, uh, but it's an open pen name. And um, the reason that she does that is uh, partly because she writes so quickly that she could dilute her own, um, her own sales by, by having something yeah um this is a decision like creating a pin name is the kind of decision that you uh you can you can wait on um you can wait until you sell the first thing and ask your agent if you need one uh but i i wouldn't worry about it definitely unless as uh unless howard as howard said unless it puts you in conflict with yourself in some way uh, but otherwise, no. In terms of how to come up with a good pen name, um, there's a number of different uh, approaches that you can take. Um, one of them is the uh, using like using some part of your real name as uh, as the as part of the the pen name 
so that uh, so that when people call it call you that you you recognize it. Um, and uh, another is um, to you know do the like middle name. I I always I used to joke that if I had a pen name um, that I would I would take uh, my middle name as uh, a surname. It's Robinette is part of my first name, um, and then uh, and then use uh, my mother's middle name as so it would have been Joe Robinette, which was a great thing until Joe Biden turned out to have the middle name Robinette. And now I'm like, if, I mean, that's not going to work. That's no, well, now it's just more confusing. Yeah. So, um, so basically a short answer, you do not need a pen name. Your graphic career and your, uh, your writing career can coexist very happily together. Yeah. It, it's worth pointing out that uh, the, this is one of those questions that, I think can be framed as, I'm not sure you're asking the right question because yeah, you don't need the multiple, you don't need the multiple names. The right question is, is there a way for me to take the, uh, the audience energy from one career in order to jumpstart the second career, or is that going to be damaging? That's a tricky question. And I can't mm -hmm. answer it for, I don't think there is a general, there is a general answer for it. Um, another, another right question is, if I'm going to incorporate, what should I use for a name? And the yeah, best makes... advice I've heard from this is pick a name that reflects you and your work, but doesn't come from you and your work. Because, I mean, or that isn't actually your name or your work's name, because the corporation exists as a thing that can be set fire to in order to protect you and your assets. And the last thing you want to do is have, for instance, the Howard Taylor Corporation be a thing that is now dead. And, well, what does that mean for the Howard Taylor brand? Um, that's one of the reasons why... Um, uh, Brandon Sanderson's corporation is called Dragon Steel. Right. Yeah. And my corporation is called Robin's Roost. Um, and it's the, the other piece is that I, you know, when you're uh, along those lines, when you're, when you're thinking about, even without corporation, if, when you're thinking about your um, Twitter handle, your website, don't pick your current property. Don't pick the property that you're trying to sell because you don't know that you're actually going to sell it. Um, so, for instance, if George R. R. Martin had branded everything with his first book, it would all be like Fever Dream. It would all be like New Orleans vampires on steamboats, um, which is not what he became known for. So, so you pick something that um, that that reflects you, that is easy to remember, uh, but is not. This is my work. Uh, later, if your work becomes a huge hit, then you're going to want to carve out that space and hold on to it. But that's that's uh, that's a different different um, different equation, I guess. Should we go into the next question? Yeah, let's do that. Yes. And since we, uh, I'll also say, uh, dear list, dear viewer, <laughs> dear viewers, uh, for those of you who are watching this live. Um, we can see comments and uh, and can if we have time when we're finished with the Patreon questions, um, we can we can take questions from the audience as well. So next question for us. Um, you said we can see comments. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> did we mention that this is new for us? Yeah. Howard, if you click on comments uh, up in, in our sidebar. Yeah. Hello, Potion Seller. Nice to see you. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Look. Hi. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining us. Um, okay. So next question. Uh, so this is a longer one. So bear with me as I uh, read this to you. Oh, um, actually, I'm going to use a handy feature of. I'm going to try this. Uh, so you all can see the question too. 
Um, Are you going to do a share screen of the spreadsheet? Oh, no, you're pasting it into the comment. That makes way more yeah. sense. So I'm attempting to write a novel with lots of ecology, real, and fiction. I keep looking for and finding specific terms that describe a particular part or behavior of a plant. Example, uh, fenestration, transpiration. Assuming most of my audience won't be familiar with these terms, should I define and use them or just use more common but less specific terms? Uh, and then I'm I'm going to hold on to that second question. Oh, hey, Potion Zeller. I'm glad, glad we're here. Um, yeah, I scanned, I scanned ahead and got to that comment. And <laughs> is that why you started laughing? That's why I started laughing. Okay. Um, so, so what you're at, at its heart, what this question is, is how do I use jargon and keep my, keep my readers following along? Um, so where I find it is that I will absolutely use it in dialogue um, in places where the character would use it. And, uh, and then I will make decisions about whether or not I want to use it in narration, kind of based on how close I am to the character in that moment. So um, using an example from historical, uh, when I was writing the Jane Austen stuff, Jane Austen could write, you know, Jane threw on her, her red and goat and ran out the door. And her audiences would absolutely know exactly what she was talking about because red and goat was a commonly used term at the time. It's not now. So what I do is I, I define it by how the character is interacting with it. So Jane threw on her red and goat, the coat's long tail swirled around her, her legs as she ran out the door, which immediately tells you that a red and goat is a long, is a coat with long tails. Um, so for things like, uh, fenestration, transpiration. Um, I, you, you just, you use the word and then you immediately pack, uh, pack that description in right next to it. With that said, there are some metrics about when and, and where you should, um, we should, should be using, using those. Uh, Howard, do you want to jump in on that? Um, yeah, there's a TV term that I learned uh, back in the nineties um, from a, I think I learned it from a book about the X-Files TV show. Um, the term is cabbage head and <laughs> it's the person who's in the scene who exists to ask the question the audience wants to ask and who we call a cabbage head because they're kind of dumber than they should be to actually be involved in this scene. But Hey, but it, it's nice that it's nice that our heroes involved them in the project. Um, as a writer of humor, I fall on that all the time. I mean, I look at the word fenestration uh, from your example, and my brain immediately goes to defenestration. Same, right there and, with you. Yeah, immediately. Having a character say, don't you mean defenestration? Also, why are plants throwing things off the battlements of the castle? Um, and we have a fun moment of, you know, explaining things to the cabbage head. Um, I would always err on the side of including words that the reader might not know and giving the opportunity, giving them the opportunity to learn them rather than leaving the words out and assuming that the audience would just get lost. That's me. Um, but I have this feeling that people who are going to pick up a book and read a book tend to be people who love words and who are willing to engage with words. Yeah. And, and like, I tend to, um, I will spend that time if it's, um, like there's a, when I'm doing launch sequences, um, I will just toss words in there 
and not slow down to define them for my for my readers because the purpose of this is my characters are doing comp you know it, this is competence porn look yeah. my characters know what they're doing and they're doing the thing if it's something where it's going to be load bearing it's going to be a plot thing that the reader is going to have to know how know what it means later um that's where i'm probably going to slow down and describe it um and if i i use beta readers and if they're hanging up on it and i find that it if it takes more than a sentence to explain what that word is, I will ju I will drop that word. I won't use it um, because it will slow the story down yeah. to, to spend the time on it. So the metric for me is kind of like, how long am I going to have to take to describe what this word means? How confusing is it going to be? Um, I'm using soul versus day on Mars because it's the day. Soul is 39 minutes longer than a day. Um, and there's a term of art for that. And one of the things that I've also learned is that in the real world, um, people working at JPL when they're wor using the Mars rovers are living on Mars time. So they have to do things like uh, use a different language. You know, is this did is this something that is going to happen tomorrow on our world or next soul? Because the the sunrise yeah. sunset, you know, it, and it, and so they they will use uh, it's like oh tomorrow we can catch up on next souls and it's next souls activities, and um, and and so explaining that to my readers, it would be so much easier if I just was like today tomorrow that would be easier, but because I feel like the verisimilitude of this is what life on Mars would be like. Uh, is important because it's it's something that I know is used in the real world. I'm being really stubborn about about doing that, which means I have to do a pretty heavy lift at the beginning to get my readers used to using it and then have to hit it again a couple of times to remind people. But by the end of the book, everyone's bought in. There's a beauty in that level of complexity. Um, that I, I would argue that that's less about the jargon and more about, hey, this is the the setting of the story requires a distinction between these two things. And if I don't distinguish, then story bits get lost. Mm -hmm. um, places where places where a piece of jargon can be used to accelerate communication among people who understand the jargon, those are the places where we make compromises because if the jargon has to be unpacked multiple times for the reader, it's not accelerating anything and it won't feel like it's accelerating anything. And so, yeah, some of those words are the darlings that we end up having to kill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm briefly going to sidebar about darlings we want to kill um, because it's so often misunderstood. Just to be clear, this does not mean that if you love something, you have to take it out of the story. It's if something is getting in the way, you have to be willing to get rid of it, no matter how much yeah. you love it. Um, all right. So there was a second part of that, um, which was also any tips for doing characterizations on, we're just going to all pretend that the K is on this, Kaiju like Melga Flora and how a character might communicate with them. Um so before we started, I joked, I was like, go read John Scalzi. Um, um, so the, the, one of the tricks that I use is that um, scientists are spectacularly bad at naming things. And they will just name something by the way it appears to them. And you can use that to your advantage. So, uh, and, and also not just scientists, but just like people in general. Do you know why a strawberry is called a strawberry? It grows in the straw. Blueberry is a berry that is blue. Blackberries, you know, so it's like all of these words actually just describe them for the most part. Um, so one of the things that you can do when you're describing the megaflora is have have a fairly descriptive name, even if it's a secondary world planet uh, and a secondary world, no one is from Earth. Um, you can do still things like, you know, calling something a um, massive prickly melon 
and like, oh, in my brain, that's going to give me some immediate understanding. You know, it's going to be prickly. It's going to be vaguely melon-like. It's going to have some sort of shell seed situation on the inside. Uh, so, so you can um, you can look at stuff like that for megaflora. It also works with fauna as well, and how the character might communicate with them. Um, whew, there's so many different avenues there. Um, like you can go anywhere from. Uh, you know, it, and and it it also depends on like level of technology. Um, you want to jump in? You've actually dealt, I feel like, I've, more yeah, with that I, than I have. I I uh, was privileged to uh, to panel with uh, Larry Niven a decade or so ago at a little science fiction convention, and and we talked about uh, you know uplifting species, and I joked about how. Uh, uplifting dolphins and elephants and whales in the schlock mercenary universe was such a terrible idea because then I had to find ways to fit the elephant and the human in the same panel, which along with the dialogue, which is an awful lot of work. And it's even worse if, you know, I'm talk, trying to talk to a whale. Um, and, and Niven looked at me a little dumbfounded and said, they just use telepresence if they can't fit in the room. At which point I realized, oh, of course they would. <laughs> and of course they would. And so I populated, when I got around to drawing one of Earth's capital cities, you know, governmental capital with representatives of all races, um, there were these little tripods with screens on them running around that had, you know, that were some of the dolphin representatives. And it always said AFK on the screen because the dolphins don't care. <laughs> They've left the keyboard. I mean, you know, they're, they're technically present. You can get their attention, but they were always AFK. Um, and, but that, that moment where someone looked at the problem I had and said, why don't you see the obvious thing? Um, I don't know what the obvious thing is in your setting uh, because I haven't, I don't know enough about, you know, the, the megaflora or whatever. Um, but treat this like an actual, an actual scientist or an actual engineer or an entrepreneur trying to come up with a solution for the problem and something really story fun might present itself to you. Yeah. All right. Next question. Um, all right, here we go. I'm doing, I'm doing the thing again. I am uh, copying and pasting. Should have done that while you were giving your answer. We're here. You're welcome. You're welcome, Potion Zeller. And also thank you for supporting us on, uh, on Patreon. All right. So, how do you power through a part of your novel which is difficult and draining on both an emotional and technical level? There are a million interlocking pieces that I need to line up to make the plot sail. Uh, was make the pot, plot satisfying. I've already written this chapter about five times to make it work. I'm still hashing out all the details. And on top of that, the external events are heartbreaking and my characters are making self-destructive decisions from stress. Help, I've lost the will to go back to the keyboard, but once I get through, the rest of the book is downhill from here. Um, I am uh, very sympathetic uh, to this. Um, so I'm a linear writer. Um, and also you don't have to write a book in, in, in sequence. So you said you've written this, rewritten this chapter about five times to make it work and you understand what the chapter needs to do. It's okay to write forward as if you have completed that chapter and then come back and continue working on it. And I'm willing to bet that one of the reasons that you're still having to, to go back in and, and adjust it is to get it to line up with where you're headed. 
um, and that you may have a clearer idea of how to make those adjustments if you write the next sections. Um, though that's like that's one immediate thing you can try. I have some others, but I'm going to let Howard go before I do. Yeah, writing <clears throat> writing the bit that comes after is if you're stuck, if that scene, if that task is draining all of the joy out of writing, then it's time to move on and write something else. And if you know what happens next, you write what the next is. Um, we were joking during, I think it was just yesterday when we had a, uh, uh, did, did an interview with Kirsten Vangsness, uh, oh goodness, where that we, yesterday. that was just yesterday, wasn't it? Um, uh, fair viewer, you'll get to see this sometime in August. Um, but I, I, I talked about how all the time I will find scripts. Well, not so much anymore because I've finished the story, but I'd find scripts where the final panel, the dialogue said punchline goes here, Howard. Um, and I'd realize, oh, oh, I didn't actually finish that because it was too hard to think of a joke. Mm -hmm. Well, pressure's on. I need to go back and do it. Um, one of the things that I've found with the, the current work in progress is that it's difficult for me to write forward because so much of the dialogue is, is very character-based rather than plot-based. They're not just talking to the outline. They're talking to the conversations they've already had. And so if I skip a conversation and write ahead, there are references I'm going to be missing. Um, and in that sort of a situation, um, I go through the bits that I've written from the really hard part and highlight them and lock them in place, if you will, and say, hey, this is good enough that I'm going to try and build things with it later. And I've highlighted it to let myself know that when I finally come back and rewrite this chapter, this is one of the pieces I need to keep. Yeah, I, I've done similar things. Um, the other thing I'll do is I'll bullet point um, what it is that I need to accomplish. And then, so basically I take the hard task and I break it into smaller tasks. So, um, you know, uh, Elma needs to, uh, um, well, this this was a hard scene. Um, Sorry, you're bullet Elma needs pointing to, what the chapter needs to accomplish what the chapter needs to accomplish. Okay. Um, yeah. And then, so like in this scene, Elma needs to, and it's not really an outline. It's just kind of like, we're the, the, here, here are my high level things. Um, needs to uh, check out the Rover, um, needs to have an argument, um, needs to make a mistake. And I don't actually know what the mistake is yet. So then I'll be like, okay, well, what are some mistakes that she can make? And so I'll list those. Um, and then I'll list like, what are some of the arguments that it can be? Um, if I already know what all of that stuff is, then I'll bullet point that, um, you know, it needs to have an argument about uh, bringing out, about following the checklist, the procedure checklist, uh, needs to make a mistake because she's going too slow. And then, um, and then I'm like, okay, so check out the Rover. That's like, what, what does checking out the Rover look like? And so I will bullet point that you, release the telescoping rod. And, um, and, and that gives me the order of operations. And then I can just approach one difficult thing at a time, instead of trying to approach all of the difficult things. Um, sometimes I will just write the emotional beats and then come back and fill in all of the, uh, all of the, the rest of it. I was actually going to show you an example of this. Um, uh, because I, find it hilarious personally. Um, so I'm going to just a second to pull this up and, um, and I will show you what, uh, what my, my early drafts often look like. Um, okay. So um, we'll see how well this works because this is the first time that I've done a screen share in um, uh, 
Sorry, it's saying screen sharing works best on a good computer. <laughs> well, <laughs> ouch. Mr. Robinet, would, would you like to send the file to me and I'll open it on my computer? No, thank you. I, um, I am perfectly content to screen share from my apparently crappy computer. Oh. Um, all right. So, uh, so what you have here is, uh, so this is, hello, welcome. You're getting to see a uh, backstage of uh, Lady Astronaut book four. Um, so this is, this is a scene the way I initially wrote it. Uh, my hands were clumsy on the rover part as I did a thing. <laughs> like, I don't know what she's doing. Um, I laughed and did more competence porn. Yeah, I concentrated on more rover maintenance. I'm like, you know, more rover maintenance. That's that's it. I, what did I do? I did a thing. I did a thing. Um, uh, and then when um, when it was uh, all finished, um, no, I don't want to. Just. Uh, this is what it winds up winds up looking like, and I, I can show you the original and snapshots. So my gloves were clumsy on the rover's saddle release cable as I verified that the telescoping rod had dropped free. Like, so, so what was the part? Rover saddle release cable. What's the did a thing? Verified. Uh, when we get farther down to my um, uh, competence porn. Um, I laughed and did, as I did, more competence porn. Um, I laughed and moved on to step 19 of the of my checklist, the rear fender extension. I thought I was going to need a lot more there. Um, and honestly, it was just going to a checklist. So that's, that's the kind of thing you can look for. Um, you know, yeah, I concentrated on verifying that the rear fender extension, more rover, rover maintenance. So you can, you can just like say, this is the thing that's supposed to be happening right now. Um, and, uh, and then come back for it. Uh, as far as losing the will, um, the, that's, tr that's hard. Um, one of the, the things that you'll need to do is figure out a way to make it new and interesting to yourself again. Um, thinking about something that you're really looking forward to, um, to, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's just, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the, uh, chapter that is called here's, they hear sexy fun times. Um, yeah, it was a plot point. Um, but one of the things that I'll do is, is I will think, what is something I'm looking forward to writing? Um, and, and I will focus on that instead of focusing on all of the parts that are hard. Uh, sometimes when I'm dealing with a section that is emotionally difficult to write, I will think about my ideal reader, um, which for the Lady Astronaut books is Alessandra Me Meekum. And, and I think I am really looking forward to making Alessandra cry. This is going to be so good. And that gives me something that I'm, ex I know, <laughs> hello, I'm an author. Um, and that gives me something to focus on that I'm excited about <laughs> making her cry um, as a way of, uh, of, of bypassing the, this is hard. It's like, this is hard, but it's worth it because. So you can kind of think about once I do this, you know, doing this allows me to have this other thing that I really want. And so you focus on the thing you really want. Do you have tricks, Howard? Um, I am reminded of the uh, the story I wrote for uh, story, the creative nonfiction I wrote for. Uh, um, I forget the title of the book now. It was the Robison Wells Mental Health Project. Yeah, uh, um, altered perceptions. Altered perceptions. Story I wrote was called "No, I'm Fine," and. Uh, it did not take long for me to write, but the writing of it was extremely grueling because I was writing about me having a mental health moment and, and I was, 
frankly, I was reliving a lot of it as I was writing. Mm -hmm. uh, Sandra and the kids, uh, we were down in uh, down in Moab for spring break, enjoying a little family vacation. And I thought, you know what? I'll just bang out this short piece real fast. Um, and I did. But Sandra came back with the kids, took one look at me and said, what's wrong? What happened? And uh, yeah, that's probably the hardest single piece of writing I've ever done. And it taught me an important lesson, which is that this career is not one in which there isn't heavy lifting. Yeah. There are real effects to be, to be found in this. And if you know that a chapter is going to be difficult for you, take a page from golfers and marathon runners and bodybuilders and plan to do that on a day where the next day is a day off. Yeah. You don't, you don't try and write that chapter two days in a row back to back. You may need to write it one day and then take a day off and then write more of it another day because this is hard on you. Yeah. And I mean, making it something you look forward to is an awesome strategy. I loved before long COVID loved going to the gym, but that didn't mean I could go to the gym two days in a row. Right. I would just hurt myself. Yeah. No, that that's really true. And I think that's part of the reason that while I write sequentially, like doing the research for, you know, or, or th that's why I'll do things like she did competence porn. I'm like, I have no idea what this looks like. I just know that she needs to be doing stuff with her hands. And it's like, oh, this is going to be technically hard because I have to get it right. So I'm just going to put a bridge there to remind myself of what I need to put in that spot. And then I will go write some fun stuff. And then I'll come back when I have more emotional energy. I have a friend who makes a spreadsheet for her books for, and this is for revision. Um, and she ranks them based on the amount of emotional energy each one will take. So um, fixing the double spaces, uh, you know, that takes no emotional energy at all. So on a, on a bad brain day, she'll just do that and can still feel like she's making forward progress. Um, on a good brain day, like, yes, I'm going to write the incredibly complicated fight scene with my characters making bad choices. I mean, that was, that was, I carved cartooning up into so many pieces, you know, the, the writing, the, you know, the initial scripting was difficult, um, but the fine tuning of the scripting, the placement of the dialogue bubbles, so on and so forth, um, that was a little easier. Uh, penciling was really hard because that's composition again. I'm now, I mean, I, I don't have to be super committed to any of these lines, but I have to come up with the lines to begin with. Um, and then inking, uh, you know, once I've you know, stared at the pencils, look at the inking. Oh, I loved inking. That was just chop wood, carry water. And at the end of the chop wood, carry water, I had finished product. Inking was a glorious thing because it was easy. And when I finished it, I was done. Nice. Um, and, you know, finding that sort of a structure for yourself so that you know which parts are going to be hard and which parts are going to be easy and which parts let you make a check in the in the done box, which is a thing we all are just programmed to love. Uh, learning that about your process is important. Absolutely. Um, all right. So here we have a question from the audience. What was the funnest thing to write? Um, The one that still makes me giggle is currently unpublished. Um, it's a paragraph about the uplift of uh, polar bears and, uh, and how across generations, the, the Ursamari, Ursus Maritimus sapiens, the Ursamari uh, took over their own uplift um, and, and the paragraph ends with, 
you know, larger and more dangerous than their great grandparents with the word bear instead of parents. And it's a dumb joke, but I laugh at it every time because it's it's something I could totally see the, the character in question saying. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, like recently the, one of the things that was the most fun to write um, was a scene uh, that's in book four where, um, where they, they are having a, a lunar new year um, on, on Mars. And, um, and it was fun because I just got to imagine people being joyful on another planet and the way you would ad adapt, um, adapt your festivities to this, you know, to living in a, in a, uh, in a bubble. <laughs> and, uh, and it's like no fireworks because, um, that's a really bad idea with, uh, <laughs> And fireworks are a very bad idea in space. Um, so uh, so that was a lot of fun. Um, in terms of uh, what you know what I have uh, where I was rereading and tickled at my own wit or ability, I don't remember what it was now, but I had to um, to prep for these books. It's because it, it's been, a couple, like it's been, I've written two non Elma York books uh, in between Faded Sky and uh, Martian Contingency, and I needed to get back into her voice. So I actually listened to the audiobooks, and I can't remember what, but I remember that there was a point where I laughed out loud. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm making myself laugh at my own jokes because I'd basically forgotten writing it. And weirdly, weirdly, I, uh, was writing to my own sensibilities. <laughs> so strange the way that happens. So strange. Um, Brand I mean, Twenty years ago, twenty uh -huh. years ago, my brother Randy and I, you know, we'd text back and forth using, you know, back then it may have been AOL Instant Messenger or something, but uh, um, the LOL acronym. Um, we came up with L-A-M-O-J, which was laughing at my own joke. <laughs> and we used it all the time. You know, I'd say something and Randy would res respond and I'd reply with, you know, sorry, Lamage, which means, yes, I see your reply, but I don't care. I'm still laughing at my own and, joke. Yes. Which Hello, says I'm... a lot about the way my brother and I communicate. <laughs> it does. And having met you both, nothing it does not say anything surprising. Um, all right. I've heard Brand Sand mention adding things like emotion sprint on a second draft. Anything you recommend to focus on for the first draft and what to say for revisions? Um, I recommend that on your first draft, uh, you uh, you write it on the easy setting, um, which is the things that you are comfortable with. You you focus on those. And then you come back in and you layer the stuff that is harder um, because, and, and for everybody, the, that which thing is the easy thing is going to vary. So dialogue is easy for me usually. Um, all of the character stuff, I come out of theater, I spent 20 years learning how to do that. Uh, blocking um, where people are standing, like the geography, uh, that stuff is often... I, sometimes I've really thought it through and sometimes I haven't. And so I will, I will sometimes uh, do things like, and then she did body language <laughs> and literally say body language. Um, so, uh, so I, my feeling is that the first draft is there for you to get the shape of the story. Um, you know, I come out of theater, so it's like, this is your rough blocking. Um, if you are come out of uh, art, this is your pencil sketch. Um, if you're doing sculpture, this is that rough sculpt, and then you start refining things. And the reason I, I say put it on easy setting is that there's the, the stuff that is is hard. Often the um, the amount of effort it takes to do that hard part will will warp your perception of where everything else is in in the 
um, in relation to to each to each other uh, because it it slows you down and 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 you get into this oh writing is hard. Um, having said that, sometimes in short form short fiction, I will deliberately focus on one hard thing. I will pick one thing that is hard for me and I will focus on that and let all of the easy setting stuff float along as kind of more of a, a, a writing exercise. How about you, Howard? Um, this is the undeveloped character question? No, uh, this is the uh, adding things like emotion sprin like in, adding things oh, on first the draft, first draft versus later drafts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, by the time I'm writing the actual prose, I'm reluctant to have big things not yet written into the scene like other characters because it changes blocking and sight lines yeah. and flow of all kinds of things. Now, if I already know that that hole is there and, and I can include some of the blocking or whatever uh, to, I, I can actually have people looking at the tennis ball on a stick. Um, and then I can go add the tennis ball on a stick in post. Um, yeah, that can work, but I try not to work that way. Um, because for me, the prose, the actual unfolding of the words, the layering of the sounds, the syllables, the assonance and cos consonants and all that, those pieces are, are how I tell jokes. And I'm almost always writing humor and leaving something out of a scene, uh, acting to a tennis ball is difficult because, because I don't know how to stare at its assonance. Um, so I, I write very slowly compared to a lot of other people for this exact reason. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of wordsmithery going on. Well, and everybody has a different thing that they write for. Um, so I, I like the sound of words, but I don't, I do my language pass as the very last thing. Um, and so like in my first draft, my characters, they sigh a lot. They spend a lot of time sighing and nodding and, and looking meaningfully at things. Uh, and then I go back and clean it up so that there's some variety of movement. Um, so related to that is this question. Uh, when you discover you have an undeveloped character at, um, as you are writing, do you pause to figure them out better or do you keep writing and figure it out as you go? Uh, any advice on how to discovery write this? Um, I'll do both voice ways. Voice pass. Yeah. Doing, do I say voice pass. The, uh, the work that you do in a voice pass is way after what you would do here. Um, but it's, it's the audition. It's where you sit down and you, you just write that character and you have them talk and interact with a set and other characters. And it's not even part of the story. It's them auditioning for the part and you get into that voice. Um, and often, often, uh, I find that I have to do this for established characters before I can make the voice pass so that I know, so that I have their voice kind of locked in um, and I'm not accidentally having the wrong character tell a joke, for instance, or your wrong character deliver a line. Uh, so, but the, the audition, the audition thing, I think we gave that as an exercise. Yeah, we did. A bazillion episodes ago. Um, so I will, uh, I'll do both depending on, on the nature of the undeveloped character. Um, so sometimes I'm like, oh, you know what? I really need to figure this character out because, um, they feature, they're, they are supposed to feature heavily in this, 
and um, and I don't understand them well enough to carry on. Um, and so then I'll, I'll stop down and think about uh, very accurately, what's their motivation? Um, but uh, but that helps me. It's like, why why are they here? What what is the you know, what's going to cause them to buy in more to this quest? What's going to cause them to nope out? Um, so, you know, what's important to them? Uh, because that's going to affect the choices that they make. And uh, and then one of the other, the shorthand things that I'll do is um, figure out what their thing is. Um, so I had an undeveloped character in um, the Phobos experience, uh, which I think you can read. I think you can read that online. Um, but the, in that... Uh, in that one, one of the characters um, was uh, not sticking in people's heads, and um, and he didn't. He kind of like for. It wasn't that he wasn't important. It was just that there needed to be three people on this ship because that's how the ships work and was established in canon. So I needed three characters, but for the story, I really only needed two of them. Like, and that was part of the reason that the third character just sort of vanished. Um, and so what I decided was that his thing was he was a geologist and that he liked to make, um, nice jokes. Um, he, he just, everything was a ge if there was a geology pun available, he made it. And, um, and that was his thing. Um, and that, you know, that was a short story that could, if that was the only thing going on for that character over the course of a novel, he still would not be a particularly developed character. So, you you, you know, at that point, that's when I really need that motivation to be present. Um, uh, but uh, but that's, that's a, a choice that you can make. Um, Wilbert in the Martian Contingency uh, is a German engineer and one of his, his, his thing, it's a joke thing again. Um, but his, his thing is that he, uh, he had read somewhere that for team building, it was that jokes helped with team building and being a German engineer, he bought a joke book and memorized it. And so he had a dad joke for every possible occasion. Um, and, uh, uh you know, another character, um, uh, the uh, Fantine in The Spare Man, her thing is the way she, that, that she made a deal with her priest that she would not curse. Um, so instead, she would say things like um, fart weasel. Uh, and, and, and so like all of her workarounds makes her stand out. So that's, that's, a, that's a way, that's a shorthand way that you can think about um, discovery writing your way into that. Um, okay, I think this one's gonna be our last one. Um, wait, actually, I'm just going to uh, share that. And uh, this, um, because yes, Mammering Lobsters was one of the, the Fontaine ones. Um, Hang on a moment. Oh no, what are you doing? Found, found the paragraph in question. Oh, okay, here we go. Here. Nice. All right. So this is, I think, going to be our last question. How do you get used to having to make big changes after your first draft? I often can't imagine how the work can be different once I've got it in my mind. Um, so again, coming out of uh, theater, I'm used to having things tossed. Uh, you know, like you try staging the scene this way and then they're like, okay, you're gonna come in from over there. So I don't think about it as being locked um, it's one of the reasons I don't do my language pass until the end is because it helps me keep it fl fluid in my mind. It's like the language pass for me is, okay, now we're in re dress rehearsal. Um, and, 
And so up to that point, um, what I will do is I will jettison things by uh, uh, by by moving them into a scraps folder. So I'm gonna I'm gonna share screen again, just because hide current comment. Um, so I, so that that thing that I showed you with the uh, telescoping rod and all of that um, earlier, when I actually got in, when I started doing my revision. Um, your sexy fun times, uh, inventory one. So I, I actually made a copy of this in order to be able to show you the, um, all of, all of that. But, um, in this, the garage is unpressurized. And when I got deeper into the novel, I realized that actually it needed to be pressurized. So all of that went away. Um, and I just, I dumped, I jumped deeper in. So, um, so I actually start um, here. Um, and then here it's like across the Mars surface rover, but it doesn't tell you anything. So I had to, I had to add a line there in order to to ground you in where we were, because otherwise you may, you know, surface, you assume you're on the surface. Um, so for me, and that's not even a, a really big change. Um, like I tossed in, you know, a couple of entire scenes. So for me, because I'm thinking about it in terms of iterations, I'm like, is this causing my readers to have the emotional reaction that I want them to have? And if it's not, it's not serving me. And so if it's not serving me, it becomes much easier to, to, to remove it. I do put them in scrap folders. Like if you, when you look at my Scrivener, I take snapshots all the time. My scrap file is huge. Um, and, and that is, that, that helps me with the illusion that I'm not wasting the words, but even without that, I wouldn't be wasting the words because they help me understand what the story is. How about you, Howard? Years and years and years ago, uh, Jim Zub uh, posted a list of common mistakes he would see in student art portfolios or prospective student art portfolios, students who wanted to get into the program where he was teaching. And one of the mistakes was uh, pieces drawn on notebook paper. Mm. And Jim said, look, notebook paper kind of says you drew it when you didn't have anything else around. Maybe you were in class. We don't care. Drawing in class is going to be good, <laughs> you know, where, where you want to be. Um, but you drew it when you didn't have good paper handy. And then you didn't redraw it. Kid, you are entering a field where you're going to have to redraw stuff all the time. Nothing in your portfolio should be something you drew once and loved it so much you just had to keep it. Yeah. And that has that has stuck with me. Um, I'm also reminded of the... Uh, I took one art class in college and our teacher shared with us... Uh, an anecdote from a, a sculpture professor who was apparently very famous at some art school somewhere. And at the end of class, he would judge people's final exam and then smash it with a hammer and move on to the next one. Ooh. And it's horrifying, but he would smash it with the hammer in order to tell them, you made that piece for me and for a grade. Now you have to continue to make things. If you want to make that again, you can, fine. Um, uh, now, is that the right way to teach the lesson? Probably not, but the story stuck with me because all the time, how many times have you lost a file because your computer crashed and you realize, oh, I was writing that for three hours and now I have to write it again. Hey, I've got good news for you. The hard part was not moving your fingers back and forth across the keyboard. The hard part was coming up with the ideas in your head and going back over it and rewriting it. 
often it ends up better. And so the idea that I say the idea, the, I, I want to scroll up and look at the, look at the question again. How do you get used to having to make big changes after your first draft? I don't know that I get used to it so much as, I mean, it's like a fish and water. It is just a thing. It is just a thing that I accept. It would be awesome if there were never any big changes, if computers never crashed, if editors never came back and said, this whole scene is terrible and doesn't belong in the book. Um, it would be awesome if that was the world in which my art resides. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, same. I, I, um, and I think really the, the, how do you get used to it is, uh, is, is the practice of it. Yeah. Um, I will also say that a thing that happens as you get deeper into your career, um, is that when you cut something, you think, oh, that's going to be really good bonus content for my Patreon supporters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never throw anything away. Yeah. It's, I mean, things that are lost because of a computer crash are their own story. But uh, yeah, if a scene needs to be needs to be removed, the scene goes into the boneyard and and I yep. will recycle it for parts if necessary. Yeah. Well, uh, we are out of time now. Thank you all so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this and you'd like to be able to submit your own questions on a regular basis, uh, please join our Patreon. Um, that's uh, Patreon dash writing excuses. Shocking everyone. You can also, and I've seen people do this on the YouTubes, you can also go down and click the button that says subscribe and subscribe oh, yeah. to this YouTube channel. Um, yes, the channel is brand new, um, but we, we plan to keep using it. Uh, that's one of the things that uh, producer Emma has has brought to us is the requirement that we do things like this for you. So, yeah. Uh, and with that, uh, we are going to end with this comment. You're out of excuses. Now go Rhyolite. Ha, 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 ha.